All right, we're live. What's up, Amir? Welcome. What's up, brother? How you been? Good, man. It's been a long time. Last time I saw you, I think uh, I was on your channel a few months ago. Yeah, man. Lots has changed in those couple of months. <laughs> Lots has changed indeed. Yeah, we have to catch up on so many topics. Uh, let me introduce you guys to Amir Rosick, a friend of mine I met a number of years ago at a uh, mastermind event in Toronto. Uh, Amir is a serial entrepreneur, marketing ex expert, investor, and a blockchain evangelist. As a CEO of Block Geeks Incorporated, Amir is also a speaker and has spoken about blockchain at Mars Western University, as well as a respected blogger in the blockchain field who has appeared as a speaker on sites like VentureBeat, Huffington Post, The Next Web, and Engadget. You've done a hell of a lot more than just that, though. Yeah, you know, when they tell me to like write an about page, I'm like, yeah, I don't give a fuck, whatever. <laughs> I don't even know um, if I wrote that. Maybe. I don't know. Like, even when I go to conferences, which I don't go anymore, actually, this year, you know, you and I were just talking about before this. I went to like, fuck, too many countries, too many conferences and look back in hindsight. I'm like, oh, fuck all this shit. Yeah, but it's they, they, time. I know. And they try to like big you up. I'm like, oh, look at this, like ego driven shit. I'm like, I don't, I just really don't care. Yeah. Well, I mean, like the last business that you had that you were building up was the one that was, um, it was that men's underwear business that held silver lining in it to protect your nuts from um, like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I sold my shares to my partners for that. It was about like five years ago. Yeah, yeah. So um, well, we were going to talk today about stuff tied around, you know, blockchain, cryptocurrency, politics, economics. I mean, you're pretty vocal on Facebook. I don't, I don't see you too much on um, other social platforms. But I mean, you've you've got huge engagement on there on those topics. So lately, with blockchain and Bitcoin, it's been taking a bit of a dive, and we saw what happened with Quadriga lately, which is a mm -hmm. Canadian um exchange they basically like what did they tie up it was like a few million dollars worth of crypto that people were holding on quadriga um yes R right this is all supposedly so we haven't had 100 percent confirmation so this isn't set in stone i have no idea this is allegedly there's about something in the north of like 20 million fiat currency locked in quadriga and certain banks are frozen i think with cibc Mm -hmm. And then allegedly, allegedly, it hasn't been proven yet, there is a hundred million dollars plus worth of crypto lost. Yeah. And this is why you don't keep your crypto on exchanges. I mean, you told me this a number of years ago and I started putting it on my ledger wallet. So yeah, man, listen, if it's like 20, it's like a hundred bucks, who gives a fuck, right? But you know, there's one guy on there's like, yo, I kept a half a million dollars. I'm like, you kept a half a fucking million dollars on the exchange? Yeah. I'm like, ugh. It's some incredibly bad decision making, right? I mean, um, you don't own your crypto if it's held on an exchange, and we've seen uh, like exchanges get hacked too, right? So that's another threat. We were we were talking last time, maybe about a year ago, about uh, decentralized exchanges. Have they come any closer? Bro, last time we talked, I said, well, mark my words, another big exchange is going to go down. There's one, yeah. <laughs> There's like multiple ones that went down. A decentralized exchanges were still very, very far out. Um, it's still very pain in the ass for onboarding because with decentralized exchanges, you don't have the option of wire transfers. You're just doing native natively with crypto to crypto. Um, I, I still think we have a couple of years to go for that. Binance is actually becoming a decentralized exchange. I think they're going to do a good job of it, but it's going to take a couple of years. So it is what it is. My, my advice for people is regardless of where you buy crypto, doesn't matter if it's an exchange or local Bitcoins or whatever, OTC broker, uh, keep it offline, man. Like this little guy right here, like this thing's like a hundred bucks. Keep yeah. it on here. It, honestly, anyone can use this. This isn't rocket science. Like install, take down your 24 word seed phrase, send your crypto here, end of story, buy. Yeah, then you own it. It's basically a bank in your hand. Yep. So. Where in Canada would you recommend people buy their crypto from now that Kadriga shut down? Because that's where I used to get mine from. This is kind of a selfish question for me. <laughs> uh, BitBuy is pretty good. So my buddy Adam runs that. They're Toronto based. They're a really good company. OG crypto guys been in space for a very long time. What is it? BitBuy.com.ca? Uh, uh, I think they have all the different extensions. So if you just type in BitBuy, yeah. Got it. Um, believe it or not, uh, if you... If you have a TD account, you can still do stuff with Coinbase, even though they're not uh, Canadian. Mm -hmm. TD allows it. Um, but it all depends on the amount that you want to buy. Like if I tell people, if you want to buy north of 5K, don't go through an exchange per se, just do an OTC over the counter. It's mm -hmm. quicker, faster, easier, and cheaper. 
how do you do an OTC? Like, where do you purchase the crypto if you do? So a, a lot OTC of the, five grand? a lot of these exchanges have OTCs. They mm -hmm. have like pro accounts. They'll do it for you. Uh, there's mm -hmm. uh, big. Ex there's big uh, brokers like uh, Cumberland Mining that I work with. They'll help you out. Like literally, you can call them. And be like, hey, I need, for example, one hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of X, and then within twenty four hours, they have you set up. So I have an interesting question to pose to you because I was having a, a conversation the other day with this. Um, gentleman he does he does really well i mean he's you know he's pulling in about a couple million dollars a year and we were talking about investments and he was asking for some advice on some areas to put money and i still recommend that guys should put at least five percent of their uh cash or investments into some sort of cryptocurrency probably bitcoin is the best to put it in still um but the argument always comes up and it's hard to disagree with it <clears throat> the cost of mining is exceptional the cost of verifying transactions because of all the mining and the equipment that's required is pretty significant. Um, are those things being worked on right now? Like I know there's a lot of um, developers that spend most of their time on Bitcoin development. What's your view on that? Like, how do you deal with that argument? With the cost of mining being too expensive as in relationship to the price of Bitcoin? Yeah, like the cost of mining, the cost of the electricity, the cost of the equipment being uh, more expensive than the value of the currency that um, is being verified for transactions or mined. So there's a couple of things to take in consideration. One, we actually don't know across. Okay, so there's a, there's a recent study which looked at the energy sources of crypto mining. And it turns out majority of these energy sources are actually renewable energies. And depending on where you are, because people always make the assumption they're, they're looking at the prices based on North American prices. Let's say like four cents a kilowatt, which is pretty cheap. Um, but none of the grand scheme of things, like a lot of places in China and all these countries are almost getting it like subsidized. They're almost getting zero cents a kilowatt. And so depending on where you are, depending on the cost of your hardware, depending on the cost to run everything and depending on how long term you're thinking and depending on where you entered in, it's actually a, a misnomer that people are, people are mining uh, at a loss. That's a misnomer. And the actual energy usage in comparison to what? In comparison to the energy usage of gold mining, in the comparison to energy usage of all the banks running, even like a simple number someone did not too long ago, in, the, in, in comparison to the energy usage of all the fucking ATMs in the world, mm. right? And so for me, when I look at it, I'm like, that's the cost of having a very secure ecosystem in a network. Like, listen, like people work very hard through building businesses, through investing in other forms and investments, and for the most part, people want a USD greenback as a store of value, right? If I'm going to get paid in any currency, I want to get paid with American dollar. Now, I've put in a lot of my labor and labor can be defined as uh, equity, sweat equity. So me physically working, earning my value and my money is labor as well. And so when I earn uh, my, my money, my monies, I'm very diligent of where I want to allocate my monies to. And so when I'm looking at Bitcoin, you know, and as you mentioned earlier, for me as an individual, whether you're, whether you are a professional investor or whether you're trying to look at like legacy savings or we're trying to even beat inflation, I think it's very wise that, and I'm not gonna put a high number. I think even 1% of your net worth in Bitcoin is a wise decision right now. Yeah, have you read Sapiens by the way? Of course, Sapiens, Homo Deus, and 21 Lessons for 21st Century. Yeah, so one of the big takeaways from Sapiens is, um, you know, humans' ability to subscribe to gossip and, um, you know, common beliefs like political opinions, law, uh, you know, religion, and even money. And, you know, over time, you know, Homo sapiens have been around for about 70,000 years. Like, over time, we've created a form of currency that we never really used before. But it feels like to me anyway, that currency, like fiat currency is coming to its end. Uh, I don't know if it ends now or in 10 or 20 years or 50 years, but it seems like it's going to be winding down at some point because it doesn't seem to solve the problems the way that Bitcoin does, right? Yes what are your and thoughts no. on that? Yeah, uh, okay, I, go. So Bitcoin, at least the narrative is, so in Homo sapiens, the greatest invention that humans have invented is storytelling. So it's mythology. Without narratives, without storytelling, we could not perceive reality. And reality right. always changes. And you can, and this is why you can argue with somebody or debate somebody. And each of you are actually absolutely right because in your perceived reality, that is absolute truth. And yeah, but I mean, like the vast majority of the world right now believes the reality that the U.S. dollar, the greenback, has a specific value. 
the reason yeah. why the reason why it has value is one reason only military force that's the how's reason that? how's that it's very simple if you don't use us as the hedge we go after you this is the reason like if you look at like very very interesting reasons why they went after let's say Gaddafi or why they went after Saddam uh or even recently the tariff wars between China I think right now we are in an we're in our currency wars with China you talked about fiat disappearing I don't think so fiat will disappear as fiat I think cash will disappear which is very scary uh, for me, cash is the original Bitcoin. If you read Satoshi's white papers, peer-to-peer -peer digital cash, it's it's not a store of value. Uh, in, it never said anything was store of value at the beginning for the white paper. This just evolved with the narrative and evolved with the te technology. When you're talking about store of value, you're talking about fiat currency or you're talking about Bitcoin? Bitcoin, gold. Okay. Yeah. Um, digital gold. Yeah. And so, you know, when I have cash, I can then transact and communicate with anybody I want person to person in real time, right? No one's telling me I can't do it, right? There's no government agency. There's no like swift middleman. There's no bank telling me, Hey, stop this transaction. If I go to Richard and I give Richard a hundred bucks and Richard gives me, I don't know, some, uh, you know, some lemons that is a consensual transaction that me and Richard just did. And so, yeah, you're right where fiat as we know it, which is physical cash is under assault. We see that happening in India. We see that happening in China. Look at China right now. North of 75% of all transactions based on paying your bills is done on WeChat. All your transactions are monitored. All your bills are paid on WeChat. All the messaging and all the communication you do is on WeChat. They even have social credit systems right now like Black Mirror, where depending on how well of a citizen you are, you're, uh, you are granted the privilege to use a high-speed train as opposed to a bus. It's pretty mm -hmm. fucked up if you ask me. And so... One of my predictions is I believe that China will be the first country to stop physical cash and they will use some form of a blockchain or cryptographic currency. They will switch, they'll switch their RIMB onto that. But that's very dangerous because now they know exactly how much money you have. They know every transaction that you do and any given time they can confiscate that money and any given time they can tax you any rate they want. It's You're ultimate. talking about a centralized currency that China would offer, not not adopting Bitcoin as its main currency. Exactly, centralized yeah. currency, which is no, it's it's much. Which is no different than paper or fiat currency, anyway. Yeah, right? but at least with paper, they can't track what they do with paper. Mm. This this is all digital. There is no paper. Goodbye, paper. So, I mean, we know that uh, banks, credit card companies, and government are vehemently opposed to. Uh, Bitcoin simply because they can't control it. They can't print it. They can't track it. They have a hard time taxing it. Um, they don't like it. I mean, I think we already know that, but um, how does, how does Bitcoin come into its own stride in that sort of environment where the banks and government have so much power and influence on money and the control of the citizens that live in that state? Believe it or not, I think a lot of governments actually like Bitcoin. So I'll, I'll play the devil's advocate over here. Uh, we'll use Venezuela in a, as an example. So we have, uh, what was his name? I think, was it Maduro? Who's, who's the guy they're trying to kick out? And I think it's Maduro. Whatever the socialist dude is. Yeah, the communist yeah. guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Maduro. Um, imagine you are an individual that under certain situations have have and has done nefarious things and has made money in very illegal ways, what better way than to hide your money in something that is portable, cryptographically secure, and you can do it at whim anytime you want. So I, I actually believe that a lot of government officials and a lot of, a lot of uh, banks like Bitcoin for that reason. Um, it's interesting. It's very interesting because think about now you're this individual in this country that everybody hates how hard would you and like for example how hard would it be for you to transfer let's say 10 billion dollars out of that country when there's digital banking embargoes on you very difficult and so they're using systems like bitcoin to transfer wealth and to keep wealth and so i think bitcoin is a beast by itself uh it's very interesting it's hard to classify and it's hard to control because it's open source meaning it's voluntarily anyone can join it when they want doesn't matter if you're a billionaire doesn't matter if you have a dollar doesn't matter if you have 50 cents and anyone can exit at any given time so it's very fascinating now there is a flip side to this richard a complete flip side it is not 100 percent 
uh, private, not yet. It's actually quite easy to track your transactions. It's synonymous, meaning if you keep on using, let's say three to four same addresses, and through your behavior, we can do social engineering, we can find out who you are. And then we can find out exactly every single transaction you've ever done throughout the Bitcoin blockchain. Is that an easy process to facilitate on a mass scale to track like an entire population or is it a lot more? Actually, like believe it or not, it's quite easy. It is, okay. Yeah, 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 for now it is, yeah. So currently on CoinMarketCap, I mean, last time I looked at this when we chatted, it was just under 2,000. They got 2,067 cryptocurrencies. That includes tokens and everything, right? What the fuck is going on? Why do we need 2,000 of these things? That's less of fair capitalism, man. People just uh, making tokens and uh, it takes two to tango, right? You and I can do an ICO even though, I don't know, some places are illegal, some places aren't, some places welcome into open arms. And if people want to invest in you, so be it. Like, it's, it's one thing... It's funny because people hate on ICOs and I'm one of them. I don't hate on the ICO itself. I hate on the representation of a token because I believe 99% of them don't need token, but people never ever hate on the investors. I'm like, you know, Richard and I can be like, hey, we're making the new fucking Toronto shit token. Mm -hmm. Well, fuck investors give us money like shit. We've got Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP and EOS in the top five, actually Litecoin's back in the top five now. Um, what's happening with Ethereum lately? It's going through a lot of growing pains. Uh, this year's a big year for it because it's switching over to a new type of consensus. So proof of work, which we talked about in Bitcoin is you have to buy all these big rigs called ASICs. You have to spend money on electricity, on overhead. On the, Ethereum switching to proof of work now? No, it's always been proof of work. Oh, okay. Yeah, switching to proof of stake. So digital uh, consensus model where instead of you buying all physical hardware, you're taking uh, your monies and then you're staking it online instead. Got it. And XRP, like, is that still being used by the banks? I don't think so. It's ever been used by the banks. I thought it was a banking token so they could transfer funds through it. We, I don't know what the fuck they're doing. <laughs> so there's no clarity on that. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. And what about Litecoin? What's your view on that right now? I, I don't know. I don't like. For me, I pay attention to Bitcoin, Monero, Zcash, and uh, Ethereum. Um, besides that, no, nothing really. Tell you the truth, is Monero and Zcash truly private? Zcash is private by opt-in. Monero is private by default. So those are the big differences and the the technologies they use for encryption for privacy a little bit different monero uses something called ring signatures and zcash uses something called zk snarks which i won't get into but it's two different forms of technologies for privacy let's switch gears a little bit you talk a lot about politics on your uh, posts on facebook especially maybe, maybe i don't i don't know <laughs> you've been a big fan of city states and yeah. it almost seems like the default position that sapiens are designed to operate in in smaller sort of communities uh you know the globalist agenda to unify the entire world under one brand and one ideology seems a little bit it seems batshit crazy in my mind because you always see people fighting all the time about well here's my view and then we've got this view and we've got socialism and we got capitalism and we got libertarianism and we got uh you know, universal, be you know, basic income. And we see all these ideologies that they try to push onto the world as a whole. And your view on, on city states, you think is a solution. Can you kind of explain why and how that solves a lot of the problems? Sure. So Owen E. Wilson is a biologist and he has one of my favorite quotes of all time. It, he states, we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions and godlike technologies. And so for all the advancements of technology that we have today and the improvements of civilization, we're still fucking apes. We still have millions and millions of years of pressure, of biological uh, pressure imprinted into us. And so human nature hasn't really changed at all. We're it's tribal, actually, aren't we? You know, like we've always been, okay, always okay. been us versus them, right? Correct. Correct. So... Racism, for the most part, does not exist in nature whatsoever. Tribalism is a real fucking thing. Mm -hmm. Like, we can see it with animals. We can see it with other mammals. 
Uh, and we can see it even looking with uh, uh, the very few but uh, small primitive hunter and gatherer tribes that exist today around the world, scattered around the world. Tribalism is a real thing. Uh, the difference between tribalism and anything else is tribalism is a war for two things. It's a war for two primary resources, land for resources for food and uh, women, obviously. So <laughs> and so for me, I look at a couple of things for human. So we have to take human nature and we have to apply it to modern day living. Humans are vastly different. We have different psychologies, we have different mythologies, we have different beliefs, we have different cultures, we have different values. So the whole idea that everybody's same is fucking retarded. And so how do we create a system that creates optionality, which is very important, optionality for everybody? How do we create a system that creates proper checks and balances to keep people in place? And going back to crypto, how do we create a system that is more geared towards game theory, where there's many different variables as opposed to only one variable. And so let's talk about city states. City states aren't new. They've been around forever. In fact, that's the default of how human civilization uh, evolved was city states. It seems like the most successful version of a political and economic environment for a tribe of people. Well, look at you. Let's talk about hierarchical levels. Uh, we'll do Toronto because we live in Toronto. Okay, so I'll give you an example of something happened about two years ago. I have no fucking idea if this is good or bad, but I'll give you an example of, of how higher powers come in and will fuck shit up for local municipalities. Toronto Council voted in to have some tolls on the DVP. I have no idea if this is good or not. I haven't done my research, but they voted in and said, okay, let's put tolls. The Ontario uh, provincial government comes in with win at that time and says, no, 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 you can't have it. Well, we as Toronto citizens voted for our council. Our council said this is our best interest. Best interest. Why, why does a provincial government have any say in what Toronto roads can do or cannot do? Well, we pay for taxes for our roads. And so if you're looking at having a city state, this is why it's really beneficial. Within city states, we can create our own jurisdiction, our own rules, our own laws, and our own taxation, which supersedes uh, state or, or provincial. Now, provincial's duty, the only duty of provincial is to up, uphold the laws of that state. It's not to enforce their rules or their policies on these cities. Then above all, it's also the province's duty to uphold and protect the province from federal. And so the United States was built as a republic. It wasn't built as a democracy. And so if you look at the founding fathers in the constitution, it was actually built on this model. Like for example, let's talk about Texas. Like Austin would be a city state within Texas that has its own rules, that has its own municipality, their own bylaws, their own tax code. Texas as a state would have its own rules and its own bylaws, but it could not have jurisdiction to forcefully impose their rules. This used to be, doesn't exist anymore, but forcefully oppose their rules on that city. Same thing is federal right so the whole united states does did not have a power to oppose the rules and why this system works it goes back to human nature and goes back to game theory because now you have to play very you have to play very intricate games with people to please everybody but not to please everybody as in a blanket statement it's like um i'll give you an example let's say you and i and let's we'll talk about canada now let's say you and i are living in Toronto, then all of a sudden Toronto decides to, uh, uh, or let's say Ontario decides to make income tax 50% for everybody. And then BC is a city state, right? Let's say like uh, Vancouver. And Vancouver is like, no, nah, man, uh, income tax is 1% if they had the power to. What would happen? I don't give a fuck about Ontario. I'm gone. I'm gone to BC right away. And so this gives optionality where every city state has to create better incentives for citizens to be there. And this is really, really important because when you have blanket rules and blanket laws, uh, pretty much you create a monopoly, a oligarchy, which is what is existing today in governments. It's one rule applies to everybody. Thankfully, in the United States still, you know, there's the constitution holds certain power. Uh, you know, like seven states have no uh, no income tax. Their 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 federal law supersedes. Uh, sorry, their state law supersedes federal law. 
But in Canada, that's not the case. A great example of city states and cantons working very successfully is in Europe too. Well, there's multiple places in Europe, uh, but one place in Europe would be Liechtenstein and Switzerland. So this is how they work. You have cantons. Each canton is, think of each, not even a city state, think of each canton almost a fucking country. And then within each canton, they have their own rules, they have their own laws, they have their own constitution, and they have veto rights over other cantons. And so now they're playing literally economic games with each other, policy games with each other to incentivize citizens to pick which better canton they should go to. So it, it, it creates a natural environment to how human beings are meant to fucking uh, live. Like you look at hunters and gatherers, what do we do? We followed where the herds went. Yeah, and they we were had, nomadic. They moved around. They didn't stay in one spot. Correct. And we had optionality. So if there's better herds in, let's say, I don't know, Spain, we went to Spain. If there's better herds in like, I don't know, like Russia, we went to Russia. The whole notion that human beings are the same, the whole notion that you and I don't have fucking options in our own country, it's one rule, one law, one tax system is obscene. And so where the world is going, these small little like countries around the world, like Switzerland, like Estonia, like Liechtenstein, like Barbados, like uh, Singapore, uh, they see now a massive opportunity to incentivize citizens of the world to come on over. And it's never been easier to become residents and citizens and to transfer your money. And so countries that don't smarten the fuck up and create proper incentives to invite and attract in intellectual capital, um, those countries will bleed. They will bleed intellectual capital, uh, intellectual capital, meaning so not even money, people, they'll bleed people. Got it. Yeah. And let me ask you this question. Like I'm like, I'm tied down here. Like I've got my uh, kid in the school system. My ex-wife lives here. So we, so we share a parent. What's keeping you tied down to Toronto? You don't have any kids. Uh, you can create your income location independent. Um, I mean, you know, your wife has got a job here, but what keeps you in Toronto? Like, why do you choose Toronto? So a couple of things. One, uh, we are in the works of actually moving away for winter times out of Toronto completely down south. So that'll be probably our next thing. Uh, number two, I have very aging parents over here. So that's another thing that keeps me in Toronto, like extremely aging. Uh, and number three, I have good friends in Toronto. But that being said, I am not, if, if the tides change and Toronto becomes more and more heavy on taxes and more and more not prosperous, uh, for entrepreneurs, which I don't think so. I think actually it's the opposite. I think Toronto is actually becoming better and better for at least technology entrepreneurs. We're second after San Francisco. But if policies change and things are more difficult uh, for people to prosper, I will leave. I'm the first one to leave. That's no problem at all. Do you see a, I mean, I want to call it a cold war, but do you see a cold war between factions and people and belief systems right now. I mean, I've never seen anything like it where they're like, especially in the U S where Democrats are so hostile towards, you know, Republicans and, you know, there's constant conflict and beliefs and all of a sudden gender is a social construct and you're not born as a boy or a girl. What do you see going on there? I'm just curious as to what your observations are. I think this is just a fad. I think people, I think people are easily manipulated. A uh, great book to read on this is Edward Bernays' Propaganda. He was a nephew of uh, Freud. He actually created mo a modern day propaganda, especially the war complex. Um, and, and you mentioned Democrats. Funny enough, I think the Democrats themselves are splitting. Like you have this small fract uh, fraction like uh, Alexander uh, or AOC. I forget AOC, her name. yeah, we'll call her yeah, AOC, whatever AOC. her name is. Uh, that commie. <laughs> yeah, she's a straight up, she's a communist, 100%. Yeah. Virtue signaling, like anytime anybody pretends to be a savior of people, that's your first alarm. Big time. First fucking alarm. I'm here to help the poor. Get the fuck out of here. You're a money hungry sociopath that craves power. That's the only reason why you're running for office. No other reason. You really want to help the poor? Why run for office? Go fucking do a startup. Go do a foundation. Go do a charity. Go do something else. You know, instead of this, blah, 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 go actually do something. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't, you know, for, you know, I, we, Steve, uh, you know, Steven Sisler, we talk a lot. And uh, for yeah, us, I saw tonight, your broadcast with Steve Sisler. Actually, guys, if you're watching, uh, check out Amir's channel. He did an interview with Steve Sisler talking about um, nearly this, you know, same topic. So it's just Amir Rosick on YouTube. Go ahead. 
And so for me, I think even within the Democratic Party, like the old school Democrats are splitting away from the new commie Democrats. They're like, yo, we don't actually agree with this shit. You know what I mean? Like this is fucked up. And so I think this is just the fad. I think it's going to get much worse before it gets better. Obviously, that's how human nature is. And uh, I think after the storm has gone over, I think uh, it'll go back to status quo. Now, my futuristic uh, viewpoint is unless, unless North America wisens up, and creates more incentive for companies to come to the United States and really, really puts its foot down on freedom of speech because this is really important. Uh, China is becoming the super best. So my last business went China. We spent time in China. Like you go to areas like Guangzhou or Shenzhen, et cetera. Like, don't get me wrong. Like you don't have freedom of speech there. Uh, you have to be careful what you say. But when it comes to economic opportunities, uh, when it comes to multiculturalism, which they only think talk about it like in America, I don't know what the fuck they're talking about. You go to Guangzhou, it's like a fucking United Nations times 10. The economic prosperity right now in China and those areas is, is like a million times more than North America. It's obscene. Like it's ridiculous, the opportunity. That's why in the last decade or so, it's like 100 million Chinese have left poverty. Like think about that. Like it's it's amazing. Like it's it's one of the greatest human achievements. Like a north of a hundred million people have left something like two dollars a day now to become middle class bourgeois. Like right, but I mean they still have their hand up your ass and treat you like a puppet because if you don't behave well, you get your privileges taken away to use high speed trains, right? This is the dark side. So my my biggest worry is tight systems like this migrate over here. That's my biggest worry. And so for us to remain a Western uh ideally would be a republic type of model i don't believe in direct uh democracy that's a populism is very flawed and very dangerous and so for us we must i i can't stress enough how important freedom of speech is i can't stress that enough i can't like this is the reason why the innovation the culture the ideas the storytelling emerges from the west is because of the freedom to express my thoughts Right, but here's the thing about freedom of speech. There's groups of people that are now like relabeling your right to say what you want when you want as hate speech because they don't they agree always, with it. Those are the most dangerous people possible and they're fucking sociopaths and they are dictators that want to control every thought in your mind and they should be fought at every fucking corner possible. So here's the thing, they're autistically screeching constantly on the mainstream media, like they're like they're given a platform to of blather course, because, on about because, nonsense cause, constantly because fear mongering sells i think about these media companies that, uh, that allow them to screech away um clickbait man good headlines get a shit ton of traffic these media companies make money through advertising it's all about money like think about this um why it, it if these individuals and these articles and the and all this content did not make these media companies a penny. They wouldn't be on there. Simple as that. Do you think that feminism in its current form is a supremacist movement or a hate movement against men? No. Now explain why. So people, so you look at feminism or if you look at any ism, everybody has a different definition and idea what this ism is, right? So you have your own thoughts of what feminism is. That person over there has a different thinking of feminism is. And you look at it today and one would assume it has like a leader that represents all feminism. I don't see that. You know, I personally know a couple of feminism, uh, feminists, but these are like old school second wave. You know, they completely hate and they dismiss what's going on today. Like they don't agree with anything these mo modern feminists talk about. And so I think the notion that the word itself might have been hijacked uh, me personally, I don't believe in any isms. Uh, the whole idea of like, this is who you are and that's the only thing that defines you is outrageous. It's kind of stupid. Uh, but once again, I think this is just part of the, it's a fad, man. The, it, it comes and goes. Certain people are easily swindled and manipulated and then reality sets in and it, it disappears. Now, the length of time that it's going to take, I have no idea. So... Let me go back to Sapiens, because in because in that book, you know, he was talking about, uh, you know, the agriculture, re you know, re revolution was the biggest disaster to, 
basically sapiens as far as our nutritional values and how we manufacture food and the growth yep. of, you know, uh, humankind, sort of speak. And then, you know, he kind of talked further on about uh, capitalism being a system that we can't, you know, return from. It's like agriculture. We can't return from it. You know, what we've created is how we're going to get food and it's how we're going to continue to do it um, for a very long time. Same thing with capitalism. Yep. So, um, there's a lot of crazy shit going on out there. Like we've, you know, we've talked online and offline and we shoot some texts back and forth kind of in between our hangouts and stuff when we, you know, when we connect. Um, do you think that there's any model that we can apply to the uh, insanity that we live in right now that, that, that would potentially fix it? Or are we due for like a full reset? Like, do we need like a shit hits the fan sort of event for us to reset to a new model? Personally, if you look at human nature, it's always we need a black swan event. It's never slow and steady fixes it. It's always something that needs to crash before it gets rebuilt. Define the black swan event because that's straight out of Nicholas's book, right? Yeah, Talib. Uh, black swan, an unpredictable, massive event that shake the that sends shockwaves across the world. And it can be, for example, 2008, the economic crisis, which wasn't technically black swan because people predicted it and they can actually map it out. Black, so it... It's something that 99% of the people were not expecting whatsoever that happens. That's like, fuck, this is now the reality that they we're living in. I don't give a shit about your emotions. I don't give a fuck about your feelings. This is the reality. How the hell do we deal with it? Yeah, the last time I think North America was unified or even, you know, the West as a whole. Um, I think this came out of your talk with Steve. Uh, it was during 9-11, and even yep. that only lasted for a few weeks, right? Like, yep. That was the only time that we all agreed at one time that we have this common enemy, and it's us versus them, and we need to deal with this. Um, but that was, you know, uh, 2001, and, uh, you know, where are we now? We're, we're, we're 2019, and we're in an environment where, uh, I mean, we have people manufacturing indignation to uh, destroy people like Kavanaugh, you know, for example, without any sort of evidence, any fact-based evidence. You know, we have um, people like AOC who are just fucking off the rocker, man. Um, you know, we have like this, like I had a hat here um, that said, make America great again on it. And it, people lose their freaking mind. It's a hat that says, make a country great again. Like they lose their shit. Yeah, but oh, remember, it's, just, most it's a symbol of racism, you know, is what they'll say, right? Okay, so... There's there's two parts to people. There's there are the people. Okay, so there's a mask that people wear to. There's a mask that people wear to represent themselves in the public eye, and then there's a mask they wear when it's one to one individual behind closed doors. Now you look at all these people who are screaming, and there's also that saying, you know, the, the dog with the biggest bark probably has no bite. Um, now, if you take any individual, whether they're left, far leaning left, like communists or far leaning right, like populism, like Steve Bannon or whoever, um, and you sit down with them over brandy, over whatever, one-to-one, -one, no cameras on, those are different human beings, completely different human beings. And so what I'm trying to say is an individual is highly intellectual. A group of people are fucking idiots. And so we have, for me, and this is why I say direct democracy is very dangerous. I don't believe in direct democracy. I believe in republics. I believe the law needs to supersede stupid people voting for stupid people in power because it's very easy to sway people. This is why United States, you have electoral vote, you have the Supreme Court, Supreme Judge, like there's systems in places built as a republic. Canada's well, the not a republic. systems in general, like the voting system, the electoral system right now encourages voting for really dumb ideas and policies right and that's not changing you know there's 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 still more people voting for dumb ideas than there are people voting for the betterment of a country this is why i always said that there and people hate me when i say this but i think there should be a minimal viable intellectual requirement to be able to vote a minimum iq or no, no, in no, the no. past you had to have no, no. Uh, property no. you had to have property yeah you, you had proper no no iq none of that shit. no property no 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 you have to actually read the policies of what the people are about you're voting for, right? So it's like, oh, why are you voting for Hillary? Because she's a woman. Really? That's the only fucking reason why you're voting for her? Because, or even Trump, oh, because he's one of them. But have you read his policies? Have you looked at what he wants to do? Do you understand the ramifications? Oh, no. So 
But there ha that's a thing. Like that's a real scenario. Like a lot of people voted for Hillary because they felt like it was her time. It was time for a female president. Um, they didn't. They didn't have full understanding on her policies. They didn't have full understanding on what that would look like for them. You know, three years down they the road, they shouldn't be allowed to vote. Like I give example of okay. Um, I'm right, not so a, it's like a popularity contest. It is. It's bullshit, man. It's highly folly. You look at every great philosopher, you look at all the system, populism is the most dangerous thing when it comes to human behavior. So what should be the... A group of people are dumb, like straight up, just dumb. No, totally agree. So what should the what should the um, prerequisite be t that allows you to cast a vote to support uh, you know, policy? <laughs> uh I think there should be some type of quizzes that you take. It can be like an online mobile app or something. You have to read all contenders. Let's say there's like three big contenders to become president. You need to read it. You have to understand it. You have to pass some kind of very minimal quiz. Like you at least understand the policies. Like that's a good fucking start. There's actually, there's actual, uh, people have, have, have created uh, models in crypto though, where there's skin in the game. You want to vote? You actually have to pay. And if it turns out that, so it's a very fascinating system. So for you to for you to vote, you have to pay. And something big, it's like, let's say a dollar. For you to vote, you have to pay a dollar. And this is locked into smart contract. And we can actually then track, like, let's say like you vote for like candidate A and candidate A promises policies, X, Y, and Z, whatever. And we can track the, the duration of the candidate and to see if this candidate is actually fulfilling the policies he or she said she wanted to fulfill. And let's say she doesn't fulfill any of them. You actually lose money. And so it hurts you to vote dumb. You have to be very wise with your voting next time, right? So imagine instead of a dollar, a thousand dollars. Imagine it's a thousand dollars to vote. And let's say this is like a thousand dollars the government gives you. So you have two options. You can take the thousand dollars the government gives you and vote. And then if, you're, if your vote is wrong and you vote for the stupid candidate and you lose the money, You'll think twice next time the government gives you a thousand dollars whether who you should vote for. Uh, and this is like still theoretical stuff. I'm not saying this is doable, but these are ideas. Like, why do you I get criticized for that idea? Why do I get criticized for it? Because I, for some reason, people believe that direct democracy is the only way of doing things. Like, if and it's not like you know, how easy it is for people to manipulate a group of 10 people. You know, easy, you know, easier it is to manipulate a group of thousand people. Like you see it with any election. Well, the mainstream there. media manipulates the entire population. Uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, social media platforms, shadow ban, you know, uh, certain voices and promote other voices. Of course. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, sheep out there that that follow that, um, you know, movement. Right. Listen, my my personal opinion, uh, if you can, I think I, I'm pretty sure Steven Pinker has some data on this. My personal opinion, even though we have amazing technologies at our fingertips and we have more power than the King of France and England did a hundred years ago, I personally believe people are getting dumber. Mm -hmm. That's my personal opinion. Um, dumber in the essence of they are not using their own cognition. They're not pausing and they're not thinking from themselves. They're only consuming. They wake up, they go to this motherfucker. Uh, they, they, they listen to the news 24 seven, they read headlines, they read bullet points, but do they ever pause and think and write and analyze? No, not at all. Why are you a fan of the libertarian, um, ideologies as far as politics go? So I'm not a person that believes in zero government. I'm not a zero government person. I'm a minimal efficient government type of person. I believe the government should protect our private property. I believe we should have a military. Military, uh, okay, security. Security. Police uh, force, fire, fire. Yeah, depending, like uh, let's say you and I live in a city state, uh, so you have it today uh, and we have the means, I'll pay for private, I don't care. I think private's more efficient, mm -hmm. but we should, we should have very minimal, um, very minimal usage of the government. The only thing the government should do is protect its citizen and look out for their citizen. And so that being said, obviously that has to reshape all of the infrastructure, government. roads, sewage, utilities. No, I think if the city state was created properly, federal government would not be responsible for that. It'll be local city state government responsible for that. So more freedoms. 
Yeah, so for me, it's uh, it's more of my philosophy. So when you look at any of these new policies, whether it's left or right, they want to create more bureaucrats. And like, I don't know, somebody did it lately, but I was looking at the numbers of how much inefficiencies there is for the government. Oh, I know what it was. It was how hard it is to fire somebody from a government job. It's, it's the most, hard. holy fuck, man, it's the most outrageous thing I've ever seen. Especially here. Oh my God. <clears throat> oh my God. And so and it's it, like- it, and it's very hard to to fire a regular employee here, let alone if you're a government worker. It's you know significantly harder to put yeah, that in perspective. I, I think seventy percent of bureaucrats can be let go and substitute for very efficient technologies that would save us billions of dollars. And that billions of dollars that we save can go to a lot of stuff to improve the quality of our lives in our country. But my biggest fear, man, no matter what direction we're taking, left, right, up, down, whatever. It's going to a bigger government. No matter what we're doing, it's like a cancer. It's an organism growing bigger and bigger. And oh yeah, bigger we're definitely bigger. heading to bigger government. I mean, that's been the trend. I mean, you know, government gets bigger every single year in Canada, anyway, <clears throat> and it and it and it continues to put people in in power. Like Justin Trudeau is the latest example. I mean, the guy's an adult child with a feminist mind raised by a single mother. Uh, like, you know, we don't he's even all, know if he's freaking Trudeau's son. I mean, the dude looks like Fidel Castro. Yeah, but he's also a trust fund baby, too. He's also a trust fund baby. I mean, like, come on, like the guy's a drama teacher. Like, let's make this guy a drama teacher at the next election Listen, again because I, this is I, insane. I don't mind any of that stuff. What I don't, what I don't mind, what I do not like is his fucked up virtue singling. Mm -hmm. It's like, look at me, I'm doing good, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, that is very dangerous. Uh, well, Extremely it was from day dangerous. one when he put his cabinet together and he chose um, women, visible night minorities to take up you know, the vast majority of his cabinet. And his answer was, I think is, I don't know when he got elected, 2015 or whatever it was. And his answer was, well, it's 2015. Like that's the right thing to do. Lately, when he did that free trade talk with the US and um, Latin America, he was talking about pipeline stuff. And he implied that uh, women make better uh, contractor and construction workers and make better decisions than men. Like, give me a fucking break, dude. But don't worry, bro. The, 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 what, what did he say? The budget would balance itself. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, sure. <laughs> How's that working out? Oh, man. our elections are coming up, though, in the fall. Yeah. So hopefully, uh, you know, we'll have a new opportunity. You know, I was actually looking forward to seeing a guy like Kevin O'Leary, you know, potentially leading the conservative party, but um, that never happened. But I'm sure the pendulum's going to swing the other way and we'll see, you know, what happens when Trudeau goes. Um, but there's, but there's so many people that really support the idea of, you know, the handouts and yeah, but the human social beings are, justice. Human Sorry? beings, human beings are very lazy by nature. And well, we're lazy now because we're so used to the state being the head of the household. Sure. Whereas, you know, a hundred thousand years ago or even 70,000 years this ago, is what, this is what most people don't get. If it. you didn't pull your weight, you were dead. So, okay. so you had to work. I mean, you had to do work. So my, my, my family comes from former Yugoslavia, socialist state. My grandfather on both sides, I never met them, but they died uh, a long time ago. They had, uh, everybody was more or less an entrepreneur back then. None of this like working, uh, working for big corporations. Every, it's like very small towns, right? We're very tiny, the Balkans. And uh, Tito comes in and it's a, uh, it's Yugoslavia, the Socialist Republic of Yugoslavia. They come in pretty much like any socialist country, the means of production is controlled by the government. The government comes and takes all the means of productions. They took everything from my grandfather's. And so my parents left, you know, you saw this a mile away. It wasn't overnight, like, oh, the socialists came over. No, 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 you saw the trend. Same thing when the war in the 90s happened, right? It wasn't like war happened overnight. It's like, you saw the tension. You saw exactly what's going on. And one thing I tell the story about guns in Yugoslavia, another thing that United States is really good, I'm big for, you have, it is the fundamental human maximum of law to have the ability to protect you and your family. I, I fundamentally agree. believe in that. I am not gonna put my trust and faith on the next human being to protect me and my family when shit hits the fan. Correct. And so in Yugoslavia, when the war broke out in the 90s, they had a campaign for three years of getting everyone's guns before the war came out. You know, and this is a real example of like, imagine they didn't collect the guns and every motherfucker had a gun. What would happen? Big difference, extremely big difference would happen. And so my parents left. They said, fuck this. I'm gone to Canada. Um, let's say hypothetically the Canada in the future, you and I see very strong trends of a socialist party. Let's say NDP, for example, becomes majority government and more and more leaning towards socialism. Uh, I'm gone. 
I'll pick anywhere else. I'll pick a place uh, and I'll move. I'll go to Singapore, then invite me. I even go to China to have more economic freedom than over here, right? I'll move. I have I have no quarrel to move whatsoever. My biggest worry is, is the people that the people that don't see this, they're the one that get fucked. Like you and I would move. Like I'm not I'm not stuck down. I'm not gonna live through a, a dictatorship. Well, they can't move, you know, because they're tied to the system. You know, they're so invested into the uh, beliefs and the ego investments that they've created around the state really running the show properly and believing, you know, the big brother. They can't. I mean, they're not anti-fragile. Like men like us that, that, that you know, create our own destiny, that have chased excellence, that have done the work, can pick up and go wherever the fuck we want. But, I mean, the vast majority of the population is going to continue to support and vote for policies and legislation that literally consumes the country like it's going to destroy itself over time in my estimation anyway it's called the ouroboros man the oldest symbol known to mankind is a snake eating its eating own itself tail. right exactly yeah yeah and this is natural human civilization natural human psychology you cannot defeat it you cannot destroy it. this is this is a fractal pattern that's been going on you know since the beginning of time and so maybe i don't know but maybe it is the decline of western like western living as we know it or at least north america as we know it and there's other superpowers and other more prosperous places being born like you know uh it was it was england at one point that was a golden capital of the world it was china uh, you know china thousands of years ago it was india thousands of years ago there were you know much more there's always an empire a much more prosperous place than it, than its predecessors so maybe this is the decline of the golden age of north america and then another geographical area around the world will pop up maybe it's singapore maybe it's somewhere else i have i have no idea but what i do know that's much different than before it's much easier to move now it's much more global and it's also not the fact of you just moving physically like you look at companies like amazon where where they sanction your jurisdiction in their jurisdictions so <laughs> i don't know if you look at how amazon's legally structured man but it is one interesting system like you have that up so you have you have um, you have their main incorporation in Ireland, which is one percent corporate tax and below, right? Then you have different companies around the world set up to own IP rights, and these are very like interesting jurisdictions around the world. It can be like Luxembourg, it can be Liechtenstein, it can be Switzerland, etc. And then basically, what they do is they'll loan each other money these different IP entities around the world and at the end of the day Amazon has no profit hence no tax they have to pay and so regular people think oh for me to benefit on like paying low taxes or to benefit on me keeping my money that means I have to physically leave the country it's not the case whatsoever well, corporations right? have the flexibility to structure that way I mean Apple's got a similar sort of structure and I think most large corporations that are doing over a hundred thousand or a hundred million dollars a year um, it it makes financial sense, especially if they can location independently create what they're doing to structure the organization that way so that they pay, you know, the minimum amount of taxes. I mean, um, I guarantee you we'll see in the future where this is going to be transferred over into what do we do to stimulate citizens of regular means like Estonia has this already where you and I can go right now become an e resident of Estonia. I don't have to be a corporation or a millionaire. What does an e-resident entail? That so basically I, structures you as a corporation with a, with it a structure, corporate tax it structure, It structures me as an e-resident. So if I want to move there or if I want to work as a contractor, I can now join them as a citizen and become an employee of Estonia. What do you think about the state of the European Union? It's going to collapse in our lifetime 100% because there's no such thing as a European identity and how the European, like even look at like the former Greek uh, finance minister, uh, Yaris Varoufakis, and uh, even though I don't agree with him, a lot of things, I do still agree with him on many other things. Um, the EU, okay, so these are two fundamental problems with the EU. One, there's no such thing as a European identity. I don't know where that comes from. Germans are very different than French. French are very different from the Balkans. Balkans are very different than the Italians. Italians are very different than like, let's say the Greeks. Extremely different. Language yeah. is different, culture is different, religion is different, et cetera. Yeah, we're living on the fucking continent of Europe, right? But we're not, we're not European identity. Uh, in fact, Europe is like Italy is a classic example of city states and how they survived for hundreds of years before uh, everything was put under one roof. I just spent like a couple of months in Europe. And one of my things I was doing in Europe, I was talking to all small business owners that went everywhere about their personal, not what the media tells, tells you, but their personal uh, experience with the EU. And so one European identity doesn't exist. 
Number two, the economic fiscal policies, what they have is very draconian. They impose very a martial law stating you must oblige by our economic policy. You must eliminate your local currency, only, only use our local currency, and you must follow every th single thing that we say. I'll give you a funny story with Italy. So for the last five years, in southern Italy, the European Union was suing the Italian pizza makers for using wood, wood stoves. They're like, no, 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 no. It's not environmentally friendly. You must use elect. Imagine you, uh, like fifth generation Italian family that's been cooking uh, wood fired pizza for hundreds of years. All of a sudden, these fucking bureau shitheads come from Brussels and tells you, no, 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 no. You're only allowed. And they had to fight them in EU core for five years and spend fucking millions of dollars, and they finally won. And like these very small, stupid uh, policies. And you know, sad news in Montreal. Montreal just lost the wars for bagels. Now bagels can't. We can't have wood fire bagels no more in Montreal. <laughs> it's so fuck. <laughs> it's beyond fuck. And so it's gone. Like you're, you're, in our lifetime, the EU is gone. All that is gone. Well, we see a lot of countries opting out. I mean, we've seen Brexit. We've seen a lot of even European countries that that don't want ha that don't want anything to do with the policies that you know Merkel's put in place for the continent it's it's just not working clearly i mean globalism doesn't work i don't know why you know it's like another form of like socialism it's like let's just globally tie everybody in together and globalism, work, us. globalism only works when it comes to trade for trade That's yeah it. right but you can have global trade and we've always had global trade for you know tens of thousands of years and we've been doing that for a long time ever since you know the british you know created all the shipping routes and all the colonies and improved infrastructure at the different colonies sort of thing um, you know, global yeah, trade has been around first, for a long time. The first corporate company, I think it was the East India Trading Company in India. Right. But I mean, like when you were in Rome, you behaved like the Romans, you know, you didn't, you didn't impose your beliefs on the Romans and say, you can no longer cook pizzas with wood. No. And this is why if you look at, okay, so, uh, this is why we see a collapse of the empire of North America because it's becoming very draconian. Now, if you look at other empires, obviously History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So you can look at the Ottoman Empire, which lasted about 500-ish years, same with the Roman Empire. They all function, even in the Genghis Khan Mongolian Empire, they all functioned as a city-state system where even though we control you legally, you only pay us a small tax up to the king, and you can create your own religion, you can create your own laws, you can create your own taxation system, you can do what the keep the status quo we're not imposing anything on you now when you look at how these empires are collapsing is when more and more pressure of regulation starts setting in more rules more laws more dictation well what happens when you when you try to force human beings to change you're attacking a human being's ego what happens when you attack a human being's ego well i'm gonna fucking punch you back in the face are you familiar with jack donovan uh rings a bell rings a bell grab this book Becoming a Barbarian. Jack Dobbin. All right, cool. You'll thank me later. He talks about the empire of nothing that we're creating today. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Hmm. Um, we got like 10 minutes left. So, you know, we plan on, on, on wrapping for about an hour. Uh, just to kind of wind this down, because it's been an interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, what what advice would you give yourself if you could hop in a time machine and, and talk to your 20-year-old 20, 20 self? Like, what huh. would you do differently? I would have better fiduciary responsibility. Um, I was, in what uh, sense? In the sense of money? Yeah, I mean, I, I made a lot of money when I was younger uh, doing certain businesses, and I was stupid and I partied it. I like literally partied like a rock star. I was pissed it all. I, I probably literally pissed twenty percent of my money in alcohol, like bottle service, ten thousand dollars a night in clubs, like this stupid, stupid fucking shit. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you're young, whatever. I don't go fuck. Uh, better fiduciary management, and. Uh, that's pretty much it, man. I wouldn't change much anything else. I, I've been always a stubborn maverick. I don't fall into like populist thinking. Uh, I'm pretty like a, I'm, I'm a consider myself more like like Ronin, like by myself, do my own stuff like that. But like, I'd say just better managing my money. Would you say that you make yourself your own mental point of origin? So define that a little bit better. With every decision, you put yourself first. Oh yeah, I just actually there's a lot there's <laughs> there's a there's an ongoing joke I have with my wife. I'm like, I love myself more than I love you. Because if I don't love myself, who would love me, right? And so I'm very greedy. Like I always tell people, I'm a, I'm an extremely greedy person. Because I need to be you know, 
there's only one of Richard. There's only one of Amir. And you, the only thing you can control, and this is why I love fucking Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. I highly recommend every human being. Yeah, it's a good book. Yeah, it's an extremely good book. Like Social Justice Warriors to fucking read that fucking book. Um, I can't control what, what Richard does, nor do I want to control what you do. I can't control what anyone does, nor do I want to control what they do. However, the one thing that I can control is I can control myself. That's the one thing I can control. I can control how I think. I can control how I behave. I can control how I look. I can control all that. It's in my power to control that. So I always tell people, be a greedy motherfucker and make the best version of yourself every single day. Solid words of advice. Dude. It's been a pleasure, man. We got to do yeah, it man. more often. We'll do it in person, man. I got myself. I got the video crew now, man. As soon as winter's over, though, this is some fucked up shit. Yeah, I'll yeah, I'll come down when it's not freezing cold and there's a foot of snow on the the ground. I'll come down and hang out with you, and we'll do a, a you know something from your place For next sure. time. But uh, yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate the the chat. Um, you can follow Amir on YouTube. His YouTube channel is Amir Rosick. Uh, what else do you want to promote while we got you on? Uh, that Twitter. If you guys want to hit me up, same thing. Amir Rosick at Twitter. Yeah, so he's all over so social media under that name. Um, solid dude, understands uh, blockchain. He's you know he's trying to make uh, uh, you know the blockchain great again, of course. Um, you know, yeah, consider... I'm, gonna get, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get the red hat, and make blockchain great again. Yeah, <laughs> 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 definitely, man. Absolutely, good. It's good. It's good talking, man. I'll catch up with you uh, soon. Okay. Likewise, brother. Always a pleasure.